when it comes to benefits from trade agreements, right, the, um, it, it is understood that the country that is reducing its trade barriers, the country doing the liberalisation, is actually the country that gains the most. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, the pros and cons of free trade agreements. Proponents say free trade agreements, or FTAs, make it easier and cheaper for U.S. companies to export their goods and services while creating jobs and boosting the economy. Critics argue such packs can have the opposite effect, taking jobs from U.S. workers and shipping them overseas. Free trade agreements with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama await congressional approval. Fellow Joshua Meltzer takes us inside the FTA debate. When you reduce your tra trade barriers, you know, goods become cheaper from consumers, inputs become cheaper for businesses. So, you know, it's always led to the question, well, why do we really need to negotiate a trade reduction if the trade reduction is so beneficial for the country doing the trade reduction? And there's basically a political argument to that in that, you know, you need to show that you can get some gains in the other country's market to develop the political constituents who can support this trade agreement. Because otherwise, some of the losses which are going to be concentrated in particular sectors are going to lead to those sectors mobilizing against doing any trade liberalization. Well, let's explore your last point just a bit. Critics of free trade agreements say that these agreements ship jobs out of the country. Is that right? Specific sectors in an economy um, which have traditionally um, you know, existed behind high tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers and forms of protection and those barriers get reduced. Um, they can um, find that it's more difficult to compete with, you know, uh, the, the imports coming in. Um, but at the same time, you know, the overall benefits in terms of, you know, economic welfare um, are, are, are more or less a positive. I mean, you know, there's both efficiency improvements and there's also improvements for the consumer. Then there's a counter argument that free trade agreements open markets and help create jobs and boost the economy. A lot of um, imports that come in are not actually imports that are consumed, you know, um, like toys or um, footwear, they're actually inputs into a production process. So for United States businesses, um, you know, reducing tariffs means that they can get cheaper imports and actually manufacture and produce goods more cheaply and actually be more competitive, not only domestically, but also um, overseas. And, you know, at the moment when there are high tariff rates on those type of imports, then, you know, they're not getting the most, the cheapest, most efficient product. Um, for consumers, you know, trade barriers increase the price of ordinary goods and services. So consumers across the board are constantly paying more for goods than they should otherwise. So there's a cost to consumers. So once you sort of reduce those costs and you reduce those barriers, then broadly speaking, the economy should benefit. The issue of trade agreements often falls along party lines. Dems tend to oppose them because they say that it costs us jobs. Republicans tend to support uh, trade agreements because they say it expands markets. What's behind this kind of back and forth? I think the conventional wisdom has always been, in fact, that um, the Republican Party is, is more pro-free trade than the Democrat Party. I mean, there's political reasons for that. I mean, the, the, the most obvious one being, um, you know, the concern that the labour unions tend to have over the impact on jobs and, you know, the Democrat Party obviously being more um, allied with, with, with labour unions. Um, so you, you, know, you, you would actually have it expected that with um, you know, a majority in the House that you'd have more chance of passing these free trade agreements um, in, in this current Congress than, say, in, in, in the previous Congress. And, um, so, and, and which is why I think you do now see broadly bipartisan support for all these FTAs. I think the Republicans um, are on board because they realise that it is good for the US economy. Um, I think a lot of the concerns that Democrats traditionally have over free trade agreements and their impact on employment um, have been addressed and in, in, in a large extent. And I think this is also why um, you know, trade adjustment assistance, which is sort of a program which you know, directly targeted at helping um, people who lose their jobs as a result of trade, find new jobs, retraining, why it's an important component for, for the Democratic Party and for the administration. Other than goods, free trade and trade agreements are uh, beneficial in other ways. They encourage investments, for example. Investment flows um, are also a very unspoken about but important part of um, bilateral, broadly economic integration. And one of the things that free trade ag agreements get to is this issue of um, investment in particular. 
And so um, what you'll see, for instance, with Korea is that you have, you know, a reasonably robust um, trade relation when it comes to goods. So, for instance, I think in 2009 you had approximately $67, $68 billion in, in trade flows. Um, in terms of investment flows, you had it was closer to $3 billion. And so you see, um, for various different reasons, that this side of the economic relationship sometimes is very underdone. And um, free, trade, free trade agreements can be one way of actually addressing that by you know, reducing barriers to investment and providing the type of investment protections, um, which can include access to international arbitration, which can give businesses the confidence and the certainty um, to invest in, in this other market. Well, if the United States has three major free trade agreements up for uh, consideration and approval, and so many other countries are doing the same thing, does that mean, in a sense, that the World Trade Organization and the Doha rounds are a bit obsolete or insignificant? The important part of the multilateral round is this principle called most favoured nation. So um, any reduction in tariff rates that one country makes, it extends to all other WTO members. Um, now, that's without a doubt the most efficient way and the best way of liberalising trade. Um, the fact that the Doha round has been going on for 10 years and it's proven to be extremely difficult, and I think we've seen this year um, that the idea of doing a, a, a round actually as described in the, in the Doha declaration by you know, the end of this year, for instance, is not going to happen and there's now discussions going on in Geneva about what the alternatives are and people are talking about doing a smaller package um, or, tr or, or even moving on from the Doha round, round altogether. And as countries, I think, have realised that the Doha round is not going to deliver the type of you know, gains that they were hoping, that they've turned more and more to free trade agreements. Josh, would it be fair to say that liberalizing markets should be a part of our toolkit for growing our economy and expanding our markets? In a sense, actually, the best policy outcome from the United States would be just to simply unilaterally liberalize its markets. Now, that's not going to happen. So then the second best outcome is that we need this negotiated process, whether it's through the WTO or whether it's through free trade agreements, um, to create the, uh, the, the correct pl dynamics so politically it becomes possible to liberalize markets. And this process is definitely going to generate um, economic benefits for the United States. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.